topic. And you think about, as you'd like the banking sector to be uh, decentralised, flatter structure, more resilient. How do you begin to uh, talk to the public or the political class about achieving those goals? Essentially, you know, if, if, if um, we want to produce something, we need funding. So there's a role for banks in almost everything that's happening in the economy. But what exactly is that role? I just Quickly, I'd like to reflect on that. Banks are being thought of as intermediaries, but this is not really what's happening. Banks... What, what are they then? They're creators of the money supply. So you're firmly of the view that banks create money out of thin air? Yes, well, I, I produced the first empirical studies to prove that um, in the 5,000-year history of banking. Banks are thought of as uh, deposit-taking institutions that lend money. The legal reality is banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. So what is a deposit? A deposit is not actually a deposit. It's not a bailment. It's not held in custody. Uh, at law, the word deposit is meaningless. The law courts and various judgments have made it very clear if you give your money to a bank, even though it's called a deposit, this money is simply a loan to the bank. That's true. Yeah. So there is no such thing as a deposit. So There's you think it's poorly and it's adequately named then? So mm. banks borrow from the public. Okay, so that much we've established. What about lending? Surely they're lending money. Um, no, they don't. Banks don't lend money. Banks, again, at law, it's very clear, they're in the business of purchasing securities. That's it. So you say, okay, don't you know, confuse me with all that legalese. No. I want a I, loan. I want a loan. Yeah. Fine. Here's the loan contract. Here's the offer letter. And you sign. At law, it's very clear, you have issued a security, namely a promissory note. And the bank is going to purchase that. That's what's happening Put at law. Put it in layman's terms. What does that mean? It means that um, what the bank is doing is very different from what it presents to the public that it's doing. How does this fit together? So you say, fine, the bank purchases my promissory note, but how do I get my money? I want, you know, it's a I loan. Want I want my 200 my money. grand, right? And I don't care about the details, I want the money. The bank will say, well, you'll find it in your account with us. That would be technically correct. If they say, we'll transfer it to your account, that's wrong, because no money is transferred at all. It's already From in the bank. anywhere inside the bank or outside the bank. Why? Because what we call a deposit is simply the bank's record of its debt to the public. Now, it also owes you money, and its record of the money it owes you is what you think you're getting as money. And that's all it is. And that is how the banks create the money supply. The money supply consists to 97% of bank deposits. And these are created out of nothing by banks when they lend because they invent fictitious customer deposits. Why? They simply restate, slightly incorrectly in accounting terms, what is an accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract having purchased your promissory note as a customer deposit, but nobody has deposited any money. I wonder how the FCA deals with this, because in the financial sector, you're supposed to not mislead your customers. <laughs> um, anyway, I, so, I, I, I don't have the answer so the, to that. So the banks create the money supply yes. by inventing these claims on themselves, the, you know, the fictitious deposits. That can be actually positive for the economy, as long as this money creation is in line with the creation of new goods and services, uh, implementation of new technologies, and therefore adding value and adding value in the economy is funded by this money creation. If that happens, and we're talking about um, business investment, productive loans, productive bank credit, you will have no inflation. These loans can also be serviced and repaid. And you have a stable economy without problems and with low inequality. And so countries that achieve this, that the banks lend mainly for productive purposes, whether it's Germany in much of its 200 year history or um, in the last can century, the East Asian economies where bank credit was largely for productive purposes, then you're fine. But there's two more cases. I quickly need to point them out because that's the contrast. But, but just, just, just clarify that, that inequality is, is significantly it's lower? Lower, yes. Inflation is if, low? If, yes. And, and, the real, stable and, the, and the real economy <laughs> is booming, yes. That's when bank credit creation is focused on um, productive lending for productive purposes. As opposed to speculation and, and asset as, price. As opposed to, there's are two other types. If banks create credit for consumption, it's yes. obvious what's going to happen. You suddenly have more money create, created and more demand for goods, but it's the same amount of goods and services. So you're creating consumer price inflation. Price That's going. well understood, and, and central banks are watching that a little bit. And what's but the what's, third thing? what's less well understood is, and what's the biggest in the UK, um, it's probably more than 70% of all lending. Um, actually way more than that, um, is 
bank credit creation, so money creation uh, for financial transactions, for asset transactions, for purchasing ownership rights. Now then you have a problem. Why? Because you're creating new money, but you're not creating new goods and services. You're simply They're constant, aren't they? You're giving somebody new purchasing power over existing assets, and therefore you must push up asset prices. So this you can you can draw a chart where you show you know asset prices, land prices, property prices in the UK, and it will match very closely as as we have, I've shown in in Japan and other countries, and that also creates the inequality. So when the the banking sector has focus too much on unproductive lending and the UK is dominant. It strikes me that what you're telling me, and tell me I'm wrong, is that lending in order to get round this deposit stroke loan situation needs to be categorised. You're right, exactly. Is that right? That's right. Um, we need to look at where the money is going. That makes a whole world difference. of difference. Okay. So if money is, is bank credit is extended for productive purposes, you're fine, you'll get a good economy, no inflation and financial stability. And also, you don't have this inequality problem. And do you think there should be different capital ratios towards no. each? No, capital, don't. the whole Basel capital approach doesn't work. Why? Because it's, it's premised on the idea that banks are just financial intermediaries. But they're not. They're money creators. We need bank regulation that recognizes reality of how the banks actually operate. So what you're saying, this is a regulation problem? Clearly, yes, it's a regulation problem. That's right. We need uh, different regulation. And the only regulation that actually has succeeded in, in history, and we have good data for the 20th century in particular, in preventing asset bubbles and banking crises, which are all driven by this bank credit for financial transactions, you know, leads to this asset boom, and it's, it's a game of musical chairs, you know, you have to play it, it's mm -hmm. rational to play it while the music is playing, which is how asset prices are driven by ever more bank credit for financial transactions. The moment it stops, asset prices fall, you get the first bankruptcies, banks get risk averse, the whole thing goes into reverse and banks go bust. But you can avoid this and the only regulation that has succeeded in avoiding this is guidance of bank credit. Simple rules. Um, the simplest form of bank credit guidance is to simply ban bank credit for um, financial transactions. It doesn't mean financial transactions are bad. No, let the speculators speculate and let them even borrow money, but not from banks. That would make a whole world who, of difference. Who do they borrow it from? Well, they can issue bonds or you know, borrow in the markets, whatever they want. But that's risk reward. But they, they shouldn't get access to the public privilege of money creation. You I see? know what you mean, yeah. And that creates the problem that creates the boom-bust cycles. But in some countries, they've succeeded in preventing this asset inflation. Which ones? Such as Germany, without even credit guidance, by having a banking structure, a banking system that's dominated by banks that don't want to do this financial speculation in the first place. These are the community banks. So Germany was 70% of banks. What do you call the Landers banks? Being, yeah. No, not no. the Landers banks, the smaller ones, the 1,500 okay. right. Volksbank and Raiffeisen Bank. Okay. They're actually the main banks in Germany. There's so many of them, each is small. And they lend mainly for productive purposes to small and medium-sized enterprises. The Mittelstand, which has been the backbone of German economic success for the last 200 years, despite wars and disasters, has only been successful because they also have their local small banks funding them all the way through. That doesn't exist in the UK, and that's been why the small and medium-sized enterprise sector always has, has had a problem in the UK. So we're stuck with speculation and horrific property porn renovation shows. Well, the solution is, of course, to create these small banks. We need to create small banks they're the natural lenders to small firms. The public wants stable growth, none of this boom-bust cycle, banking crisis, public money used to bail out banks. People don't want that. In Germany, these community banks it's very interesting dominant. because They've never used public money. In these 200 years, not a single one has ever been bailed out with public money and no depositor has lost any money. Although, Richard, your argument is complex, principles are terribly simple. It is very simple. And although, you are, actually, although you are a little defeatist... I'm not def you yeah, maybe I'm defeatist, I'm, but, but I like it. But uh, it's just the idea of, <laughs> how can I put it? Go on. Getting, getting through the regulatory, they are so reluctant. But that's why it we, is hard work. But that's, hard why work. We, that's why we got you in. We're going we're gonna to have you as I the ambassador. A, it, I, I, think, I, I have to say, uh, this has been brilliantly explained. We open with the question, do we have a, a finance curse? Does the UK have a finance curse, David? No. I think it has difficulties, but I think those difficulties have been in, look, appeared insurmountable five years ago. Now I think the occasion uh, says that it's much better, but 
there is this severe danger of overregulation, which is completely understandable, not wanting a replication of what happened in 2008. Has the UK got a finance curse? Is it a trick question? Because the UK doesn't have finance. The City of London has, and it's not part of the UK. Good answer. <laughs> Good answer. It's international, he's right. The City of London is outside the United Kingdom, do you know that? It's, it's really shocking. And it, therefore it's also not part of the EU, which explains uh, the... Although it couldn't be part of the EU because you have to have democratic elections, and the City of London doesn't, right? It's, it's the banks that have the votes, right? Right. Per staff, you know, I the know, vote fact, I never knew how, do you, how do you start yeah. unpicking this puzzle? I never knew. <laughs> That's a very useful piece of information. And of course, it's not <laughs> it's part of the UK. It's a pretty dangerous piece of information. <laughs> and it's not part of the UK because the Queen is not allowed to enter without permission. She's not the sovereign, therefore it's not part of the UK. It's you know, and of course, that's since you know 1688. I have to, I have to make a note. Since the foreign invasion. <laughs> there you go, David. That dinner you're going to tonight, just drop that in. Oh, Penultimate really? bit of the speech. They'll love it. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. Um, David Buick, Richard Werner. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team an email, studio at renegadeinc.com, or tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Thank you.